When we look at the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, Brit Hadashah, New Testament, New Covenant or New Testament, uh, from the way I see it, it's broken down into four, I would say, sections. Uh, the first, obviously, is the Gospels, and the Gospels tell the story of the Messiah from his birth to the crucifixion and a little beyond when he revealed himself after the crucifixion before his ascension. So we learn about the Messiah in the Gospels and his earthly ministry in the Gospels. After that, we have the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles. And I think that book kind of stands on its own where it speaks about now that the Messiah has ascended. So it starts with his ascension in the beginning of the book of Acts. And now the apostles are left to go change the world. And we see them in the book of Acts going out and sharing about Yeshua and saving geographies and starting up communities, messianic communities or churches all throughout Asia Minor and around the eastern and central Mediterranean. So we see that the book of Acts is after the story of, of Yeshua in the Gospels. Now we see them sharing the story of Yeshua around the area. After that, we have letters or epistles. So now that these communities are set up, now we have letters to them or to people explaining to them how to live and what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong and what they need to look after or look out for. And then after that, we have Revelation, which I think also stands on its own, which speaks about uh, the, the events of the end times from the tribulation to the coming of the Messiah to the setting up of the thousand-year millennial reign to the final judgment uh, to heaven and earth uh, wrapping up. So this is the New Testament. All throughout the New Testament, from the Gospels, through Acts, through the letters that we see, whether it's to communities or whether it's to people, even into Revelation, there's one thread that we see, uh, a warning. And it's in all sections of the New Testament. And it's a warning to the readers then, and it's a warning to us. And the warning is to be on the lookout for deception. Deception. We see it in all areas, like I said, of the New Testament. Yeshua spoke about it in the Gospels. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. False prophets, by default, must be people who claim to be believers. Otherwise, he wouldn't really be warning about them. If there's some guru out there, some yogi or guru, I hope, that we're not listening to them as prophets. But he's warning the people, his people, to be on the lookout for false prophets. Deception. That's the Gospels. In the book of Acts, we see, and from among your own selves. Among your own selves. This is within, folks. This is not lies that Joe Biden may be saying. This is within the camp. Do you understand? You got it? From among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert. This is an amazing passage, and I happen to like this passage because it's, it's, Paul is speaking to the community or the church of Ephesus, of Ephesus. And we see Ephesus, this church, three times, three times, in, this, in these sections of the New Testament. We see how he, for, how he started that community in Ephesus in the book of Acts. And here, it's his, his parting words. He's about to leave them. He's about to go to Jerusalem. And he's giving them sort of like the, his final encouragement. And he's warning them on his way out. It's like, you're never going to see me again. But he's giving them a warning on his way out to watch out for people within that bring deception, that speak perverse things, that draw people away from the Lord and to them. The third time we see this community in Ephesus is in Revelation, when the Spirit is speaking to the churches or the communities or the congregations. It also speaks to Ephesus. And you know what the Spirit says? Well done. You have, you have called out false apostles. Sounds like they took his word 
and they took his warning and they did it right. Sounds that way. So there's a warning for deception coming into the camp in the book of Acts. Now we go to the letters. This is Paul speaking to Romans. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching you learned and turn away from them. So Paul brought forth to them a pure faith in the Lord. But there are others that came in that want to complicate it, that cause dissensions, that put blockages in front of people to, to, to get in the way of this simple, beautiful faith that the Lord died for your sins. And to come into relationship with God through that. Keep your eye on those who cause these dissensions and hindrances. All the way into Revelation, this is just one example. It says, some of you hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Now, we don't know who the Nicolaitans are. I know there's some folks that think it's Santa Claus. But it's probably not. If you take Nicolaitan, now I'm not an expert in this language, but what I heard is that if you take Nicolaitan, since Nico is like conquering and laity, like almost like being like abusive to the laity. I don't know if that's what it is. That Whoever they were, uh, we lost that essentially to history. But we do see the Spirit saying to that community, watch out. Watch out. Deception has entered in to the ranks. And so again, we see it in the Gospels, we see it in Acts, we see the warning in Acts, we see the warning in the letters, and we see the warning in even in Revelation. Now there's one particular time frame. Now this is always written to everybody. It was written to the people of that time. When Paul writes to the Roman congregation, community, he was, he was speaking directly to them, but it's also for us. It's for everybody for all time. The Bible is eternal. It's, it's beyond time period. In the beginning was the Word. So that divine word, his holy word, is throughout time. So whether or not it was written before, it really was written before. It's for everybody. It was for them. It was for us. It's for our children. It's for everyone. Um, so, but there's one particular time period that it speaks about when deception will arise. Now, we know deception is going to be in every generation, but the Bible makes it very clear that deception will arise at the end times. And it's one of the signs of the end times that we're going to see deception. And we're going to see it also in the, all the different areas of the New Testament. So in 1 Timothy, this is Paul's letter to his disciple Timothy. But the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. We see Peter writing, know this, that in the last days... Mockers will come with their mocking, following their own lusts. You know, when we come into relationship with the Lord, our own desires, our own quote-unquote lusts, they're supposed to die. Our life in the Lord is not a life of self-gratification. It's a life of denial, people. People. <laughs> it's a life of denial. That was my Ross Perot. No. <laughs> It's a life of, of denial. It's not a life of, I get what I want. I don't do what feels good. It's a life of denial. That's what it is. You come as you are. I don't care how you come. You come. As sinful as you are, whatever you're doing, wherever messed up you are, he loves mess-ups. That's why we're called messianic, because we're mess-ups. But you don't stay that way. The goal is to come as you are, but you don't stay as you are. So when you come following after their own lust, they're not following the Lord because the Lord causes, causes our own internal lust to die daily, every day. Now it seems, and here's Yeshua himself it, talking about the end times, false messiahs and false prophets, false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Now, I know some people say, well, the elect won't be deceived because he threw in that that's if possible. Well, maybe that's true or maybe it's not. But what it's trying to say is that these false prophets of the end, it is possible, like meaning it's going to sound close to the truth, but it's not. It's a lie. And when we put it against the word of God, if we really put some of these things against the word of God, is it really prophetic? Or is it a lie? 
you know, if you go a little bit off, off, you want to get to a certain direction, and you go a little bit off from directly, a, a, a direct line to where you want to go, if you go a little bit off and you keep going, you're going to wind up way off. Way off. Now, the disciples, the apostles, all throughout the New Testament, man, they had it rough. And it really boggles my mind how quickly it happened. Because the faith in Yeshua is so beautiful and so pure, it did not take long for many deceptions to arise. They speak about many of them from the Jewish side, from the legalistic side, causing Gentiles that you have to get circumcised to keep all the law to be saved. From the other side, saying we don't need to do anything because as grace covers, we can just live the way we want. From humanism, from Hellenism, to all these different types of of, of influences that came in sexual perversion. All these things come into the community, and, and they have to deal with all of them. I only have to deal with a couple of you knuckleheads. You're not one of them, Wendy. But they have to deal with so many, so many twists of the truth. And they had to address it, address it, address it. And I think they did. I think that the, the writers of the New Testament letters had to deal with so much deception. Why? For our benefit. So we can be aware of all these things. We may only, like in a congregation, we may only deal with one or two knuckleheads, but we, but we get the whole, the whole list of them in the New Testament that they had to deal with. Why? So we can learn from it. So we can learn from it. So it's very important that we understand that there is a lie out there. And as we approach the end, and I believe that we're in the end times, uh, totally. And, you know, I mean, you know, I, the, 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 the eclipses and the earthquakes and the lightning strikes on the Statue of Liberty and all these things. And it wasn't just uh, what, uh, Biden saying something when the earthquake came. There was literally a, a Security Council meeting at the UN happening at that time. You could watch the video of them doing their thing, talking about Hamas, talking about Israel, and all of a sudden it starts to shake. Like at that moment, right? So is God saying something? You know, but all these things, you know, it says that earthquakes are going to be a, a sign of the end, but it's not really the earthquakes that make me fully convinced that it is the end times because earthquakes have always happened. It's not, even though the eclipses are a sign of the end, it's not the eclipses that maybe say, okay, it's the end because eclipses have always happened. The one thing that's, that, that is new to our generation is the nation of Israel. Is the nation of Israel. And I will always go back, I often go back to Zechariah 14, where it says that all nations will come against Jerusalem. All nations will come against Jerusalem. And I'm sorry, it's going to include America. At some point, we pray for America, we pray for righteous laws and righteous leaders, but it, the decks are stacked, I'm sorry, against America because all nations are eventually going to come against Israel. And now we see in the, in the UN where they took a vote, you know, against Israel and America, everybody voted against Israel, America, instead of, instead of voting no uh, against it, they actually abstained, so they let it happen. Right? And that's really the first step in like all nations coming against Israel. And it says that, it says that it's going to come against Jerusalem and, and half are going to be exiled. And it speaks in Zechariah 14 of, of, of women being raped. It's interesting that it's an end times prophecy, but when it talks about the war, it doesn't talk about bombs and guns. It talks about these archaic methods of warfare that Hamas does. We see that. But it says, then the Lord will fight as one who fights on a day of battle. And he'll set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives will split. So if you want to see earthquakes, that's one earthquake. That will definitely be a sign of the end, okay? We don't know if the one in uh, Lebanon, New Jersey, and White House Station, New Jersey, it might very well could be for sure, but I'll tell you, the one that's going to happen on the Mount of Olives where it turns into, turns into two mountains and a valley, that's the one that's prophesied. We see that one happen, watch out. And it says, then the Lord will come. Then the Lord will come with his holy ones. So we see it's very centered around Israel. So it doesn't matter the earthquakes and the eclipses that happened pre-1948. Israel has to exist for the Lord to come back. And that's consistent all throughout. So I do believe it is the end times. I do believe that what has happening in Israel is something that it can lead into or will lead into ultimately the end. So with that, getting back to this, 
the Bible is very clear that there will be deception in the ranks. Not in the, in, in, in the world. We know that deception is going to be in the world. You know, there's one place in the scripture, it's in 1 Corinthians 5. I wish I had it up, so I'm going to have to paraphrase it, unfortunately. But please look it up. He's saying, stay away from the sexually immoral, Paul says. And he says, but I'm not talking about the people of the world. Otherwise, you're just going to have to leave the world. Because everybody's like that. I'm talking about those who call themselves brothers in the faith. That's what he said. He said, who am I to judge the world? God will judge the world. I tell you right now that one of the deceptions, we spend way too much time judging people out of the body. Like, okay, yeah, Biden said this, but what do we expect? What the heck do we expect? What do we expect from any of them? What do we expect from any of them? What do we expect from any leader? What do we expect from anybody? The issue is what happens here. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Deception, we know that there's, they're perverse out there. We know that they're deceived out there. We know that there's flawed teachings out there, and it's bad, and we know that they're affecting our children and all these things. It's not like we can't pray over it, but the, what God wants us to be concerned about when he talks about deception is not, you know, Paul doesn't say, boy, you know, the Roman Empire, they're really deceived. He doesn't say that. He's worried about the, the community, Messiah's community. That's what he's worried about. What happens out there happens out there. Right? And let's be like Pastor Bob. Jesus loves you. <laughs> Was that good? Okay. So, where does this deception exist? It is within. It's within. So, this is a word to all of us in the end times to watch out for this. Now, I can do a study on the deception that would last 10 weeks. But I have here, in this very uplifting message a list of deceptions that we need to look out for because they're listed in the Bible, and these can come in to our body or generically the body of Messiah or into our hearts as individuals, and these are things we need to look out for in the end times. So deception, one of the deceptions is immorality. The immorality of the world. Now, we don't, we're not pro-life for political expedience. We don't do it for the votes. You know, we hope that the, we hope that the people of the world, like they, they feel the same way we do and they're going to vote a certain way, but that's not why we do it. It could lose us elections, but we stay true to the truth. We stay true. It's not for political expedience that we say that homosexuality, homosexual sex is a sin. It's not, it's not for political expedience that we say that homosexual relations is sinful. It's not for political expedience that we say that when God created you as a boy or a girl, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. It's not, for, it's not to be liked. It's not for political expedience. It's because we don't, want, we don't want the immorality of the world to come in. But it does say, now Jude is a great book to read. It's, it's actually one letter. It's actually one chapter. And it just precedes Revelation. And because of that, I think there is an end time significance to it. And he's speaking about, perver- he's speaking about deception that came in. Uh, to the community. And he says, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed, and I'm sorry, I don't have the whole thing there. That's the dot, dot, dot. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Messiah, Yeshua. Anybody know the word licentiousness? It's like sexual immorality. It's immorality, but primarily sexual immorality. And here, Jude, the writer, is talking about a sexual immorality that that penetrated, that entered into the body. That entered in. They, they made their way. They crept in. They crept in unnoticed. And they're immoral. They're sexually immoral. But they crept in. So we got to make sure that the things that are out in the world, you know, because we want to love people and because, you know, we, we can't take it to the extreme. We're like, okay, what they're doing is good. And it's fine. And you know what? God does love people right where they are. But he doesn't keep you there. I don't know how many times I got to say he doesn't keep you. He doesn't want to keep you there. The whole point of our relationship with God is to be changed. Yeah, we're messed up when he finds us. We're messed up when he saves us. But it's a life of dying to self. It's not that, well, I was born this way, so that's just the way it is. Even if you were born that way, it's a life of sacrifice. Blessed are those who have a a, a tendency to be attracted a certain way. But sacrifice it to the Lord and don't act on it. That's a blessing. Blessed are those who feel a certain way, but won't act on it for the sake of the kingdom. That's what, and we all have to do that in some capacities. 
Some it's harder than others, but believe me, it's hard. Life is hard for everyone in different ways. But it's not a life of self-gratification. It's not a life of, hey, I want to be sexually indulgent, so that's, that's it. God knows. God knows. You know, I remember people saying, you know, like somebody saying, like, you know, my marriage is bad. So, you know, God knows. God knows why I'm, I'm seeking relationships outside of my marriage. God knows. God knows what I've dealt with in my marriage. God knows. God knows why I need to do this. God knows. Right? Yeah, he does know. But you're called to sacrifice your life. You're called to die. You're not called to live an immoral life just because you had a rough time. So deception. Look out for immorality. Immorality. Immorality to come in to the church, and into the Christian church, into the Messianic community. Watch out for a spirit of immorality that wants to come in. Deception. A different gospel. You know, it says here, I am afraid that as the serpent, this is in 2 Corinthians, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to the Messiah. I love that. This, not, not the other part, but the simplicity and purity of devotion. Simplicity. Simplicity. The faith is very simple. We're messed up. He's perfect. And he took our sins upon himself so we can be set free. And then we're transformed into his image. What does it mean to be transformed into his image? What does it mean? That we grow a beard and long hair? <laughs> I, I, I am in the long hair too, believe you me. Not that Hulk Hogan hair, you know, with bald on the top and long on the bottom. But, <laughs> but what does it mean to be in the image of God? It means to, 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 to live a righteous life. That's what it means. As it means. But I love that it says it's they're being deceived, not that part, but they're, they're, the, the simplicity and purity of the devotion. The faith is very, very simple. It, he continues, if one comes and preaches another Yeshua, another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit from which you have not received, or a different gospel, he was concerned that you might put up with it. What's a different Yeshua? What's a different gospel? What's a different spirit? You know, like heaven and hell exist. Heaven and hell exist. There's punishment. There's an afterlife. There's a final judgment. I got to tell you, everyone, when the, everybody's going to get judged. Everybody in the end. And we have two choices. We have two choices when we're before the king at the end. One, we can go before him based on how well we've lived this life. We can go before him saying, you know what? I, I think I did a pretty good job, and I'm going to stand. I'm, I'm ready to stand before him with how well I did it. Or, number two, we could stand before him saying, I know already I didn't do it, and the Messiah took all of my failings upon himself. We can do it based on our own merit. We can stand before God on our own merit or in the merit of the Messiah. Option two is the only option. Trust me on that. Believe me on that. But what's a different gospel? That it's not. That maybe you don't need Yeshua. You don't need that atonement to be saved. I mean, there's many ways that the gospel can be perverted and turn into something else. We all need Yeshua. Jew and Gentile need Yeshua equally. That's a perversion. I see that. Well, Jews don't need it. They're based on a different covenant. That's a lie. That's a lie. Jewish people need atonement also. They don't have atonement. The temple's gone. There's no atonement for Jewish people. The, the temple with the temple there, at least there was an animal that all the sins went on. They don't do, there's not, it's not there anymore. There's no atonement. They can rip their clothes all they want. My people can rip their clothes all they want. They can pray. They can daven. They can fast. They can do all these things. They can wear dirty clothes and, and not, you know, and on Yom Kippur, they can not brush their teeth all they want. And do good deeds and do charity and things like that. None of that is for salvation. None of it will, none of that will, will do it. There's really no atonement without a sacrifice. Yeshua is the sacrifice. We all need it, Jew and Gentile. If you hear otherwise, it's a false gospel. It's deception. It's deception. What other deceptions are there? Legalism. Watch out that, you know, our, our freedom that we have doesn't turn into, you know, forcing people to, to live a certain way, you know, where, it's, where it becomes like if you don't do this, that you're not saved. You know, they had, to, they had to deal with this a lot. They had to deal with Orthodox Jewish or Pharisaic, Pharisee believers, actually, who said if you're not circumcised, if you don't keep all the law, laws of Moses, tell them to, to Gentiles who were never given the laws of Moses to begin with. Said, well, you got to do all this, and if you don't do this, that you're not saved. And the answer was absolutely not. That is not true. There was a specific chapter in the book of Acts that speaks about that. It's like, they, they don't, they don't, don't bother them on that. So make sure that even here in a Messianic community, we've got to make sure that our zeal for, for the Torah, which we love, the Torah is good. 
The Torah is holy. King David said that it's life. It's life. But make sure we're not putting burdens on people. Everybody's invited to the Passover table if you have the, the Lamb of God within you. Everybody's invited. I'm not going to force it on you. If you'd rather go to McDonald's that night, go for it. It's, a, it's, an, it's an invitation. It's not an obligation. But once you start obliging, ob obligating people to do it, you're entering into legalism. And Paul speaks about that. Now, the book of Galatians is entirely devoted to it. This is entirely devoted to Pharisees saying, these Gentiles, they're not in yet until they get circumcised and keep all the laws. That's what the book of Galatians is about. So especially us as a Messianic Jewish community, we've got to be mindful that we're not doing that. As much as I would promote you know, Passover and all these things, or keeping kosher even, as much as I do it and would promote it and say it's a blessing, I'm not forcing anybody. I'm not forcing anybody. Everybody needs to be convicted in their own minds of these things. You know, and, and the other side of it also, you know, it didn't take long for deception to come in even in the Christian side. When we look at some of the early Christian fathers, you know, Paul was like, you know, kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. Don't let, you know, if, if don't, don't offend the Jew, don't offend the Greek, right? Like, he kept everything very balanced. Paul did a great job in keeping everything balanced, you know, but all of a sudden, it's like one generation with the apostolic fathers, like, no, we can't do that. We can't keep the Sabbath. We can't keep Passover, right? They, they have to come and do it our way now. It's got to be on Sunday. It can't be on Saturday. That was a deception. That was not right. That was, it's not consistent with Paul's teachings. And it's, it's, it's deep in Christianity today. It's, it's not right. It, it, does, it, it misses the mark on the Jew and Gentile together. I'm not saying they're forced, but they're invited. And don't tell a Jew not to do it, right, like the church, early church fathers did. So that's a deception. And another deception is anti-Israelism. Now, the scripture I have here is a little arcane, I guess, but it says in Revelation, it says, you, you have there some who hold the teachings of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. So some people were doing that to have them eat things sacrificed to idols. So I guess eating things that were unkosher was important even in the book of Revelation, so just saying. And the commit acts of immorality. So there were people there in this church where they were putting stumbling blocks before the sons of Israel. So again, we got to make sure also from the Christian side that we're not putting stumbling blocks before Israel. Because so much these days is that the Jewish people aren't rejecting Jesus as they're much as re rejecting a, a, a Christianity that says, all these things you don't have to do anymore. And it, it's, it, it's, so, it's so dumb to a Jewish person. Why are you telling me that I, Jesus saved me from keeping Passover? I love Passover. I don't get it. Like, why did Jesus save me from keeping uh, the Feast of Tabernacles? That's a joyous holiday. Why would, I, why, would I, why would he take that away from me? I don't even understand it. You know, so, you know what I mean? And then we say, we say well, okay, well, G well, well Jesus, he, you don't have to keep the laws anymore because he, he, took, he died on the cross. Well, which laws don't we have to keep? Like, don't kill? How about don't tithe? So if, 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 the, if the hard ones still remain... And you're saying that he, the only ones he took were the easy ones, like what you wear and what you eat and what, when you celebrate? Is that the only thing you put on the cross? Like, if that's the case, then his sacrifice is very minimal. It, uh, something wrong. Do you understand? There's something wrong in the teaching. Something's, something's not right. Something's not right. And we have, to make sure that, that we have to make sure that we're not putting stumbling blocks in front of the Jewish people. And if we do, that's a deception. That's an end times deception. Another deception False prophecy. False prophecy. So the scripture I have here from Yeshua, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? I mean, these aren't Buddhists, okay? Right? These aren't people that have some other religion. These are people that called him Lord. Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And we know what he said. Get away, I never knew you. You workers of lawlessness. Right? So what are the things that they, that they were doing? They were prophesying. They were prophesying. The Lord didn't know them. What were they doing? They were casting out demons. They were deliverance ministers. The Lord never knew them. What were they doing? They were working miracles. They were miracle workers. The Lord never knew them. It is so easy let me tell you something. It is so easy to prophesy if you want to. It's so easy. All you got to do is say something nebulous, something, something unclear, and there's no accountability. You know one way to test if there's a false prophet? If that prophet is repenting when his prophecies are wrong. Because if you're just going to move on 
to some other prophecy and you don't hold accountability for what you said that didn't happen, you know, the Torah gives a very easy test on whether a prophecy, if a prophet is a true prophet or a false prophet. You know what the Torah says? If what he says doesn't come true, he's false. And how many prophecies are out there about government, about, the Ameri about America, about all these things, anything, that don't come true, and there's no accountability? Let me tell you something a little personal. Seven years ago, seven years ago, I was here, well, at Lighthouse, I was at, you know, at Mishkan, and I gave a prophecy seven years ago, almost seven years ago. And you know what I said? I said, in seven years, a, a Christian denomination, this was a prophecy I gave, in seven years, a Christian denomination is going to adopt Messianic Judaism as its, as its, as its expression. I said that seven years ago. It's almost seven years now. You know what? It hasn't happened yet. Now, you know what I could do? I could, well, maybe it's talking about me running a church on Sunday. Maybe it's Rabbi Peter. Well, that's not what I said. I said a major Christian denomination is going to adopt a messianic expression. Maybe it'll happen by the end of the year, but I got to tell you something, folks. If it doesn't happen by December 31st, I owe you a repentance and the Lord for speaking out of turn. And hold me to that. Hold me to that. Don't just say, well, you know, maybe it was this or that, you know, because it's parabolic maybe. We have to be accountable. If, if prophecies come about, we have to be accountable. Prophets have to be accountable. Have to be accountable to the things they say. That's what taking the Lord's name in vain is. Thus saith the Lord, and it wasn't the Lord. That's what taking the Lord's name in vain is. And that's what's coming about in this age. And how easy is it because it tickles our ears. And it's like, oh, yeah, I agree with that, to just agree with it. But it's nothing but human humanity. It's nothing but a lie. It's nothing but a lie. So many cases. So we just need to be mindful. One thing we can do is it's, if somebody gives a prophecy or a teaching or a word or an instruction, like, does it align with the word of God? Like, does it align or not? Like, let's just be, you know, let's just be true and looking and, and, and correcting and, and seeing these things. Test the spirits, sons and daughters. Test the spirits. Test the spirits. And casting out demons in your name. You know, I I'm a big believer in casting out demons. A big believer in casting out demons. But, I, you know, but, you know, it looks like there's going to be some deception around that. Because there are some demon caster outers that Yeshua is going to say, I never knew you. So be careful. Just be careful out there. Be careful out there. Don't believe everything. Don't believe everything that feels good or tastes good or sounds good or, or, or gives us a little bit of a spiritual high. Don't believe everything. Take a step back. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Does it align with the word of God? Not true. So be careful what's out there. Ear tickling. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Oh, and going back to, now I don't have the scripture in front of me, but going back to legalism, one of my, I have to say it's one of my life scriptures, and it's from 1 Timothy 1, when Paul says, I instructed you to, to tell people to not teach strange doctrines, because people are paying attention to myths, myths, endless genealogies, he says that give rise, listen, to mere speculation. How much do we hear now that so, sounds so spiritual, but it just doesn't do anything? It's lifeless. And it just makes us like, you know, it, it, it causes speculation rather than advance the word of God, advance the gospel. It says these people in 1 Timothy 1 want to teach the law. They want to be teachers of the law. Teachers of the law. But they don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're talking about. This is the deception of the end times. And I tell you right now, as a Messianic rabbi, there's many Torah teachers out there that have no clue what they're talking about. Their words are lies. Oh, we know the right way to keep the holidays. We know the proper days. And we know the proper way to say the name of the Lord. And the Jewish people don't. Don't believe all that stuff. Don't believe it. There's, it it's exactly, exactly what Paul is saying. That the people out there, they want to be teachers of the law, but they know not what they do. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. They think they do, but they don't. It's an end times deception. This is a glorious message. Come on, somebody. Where am I? False prophecy. Ear tickling. So the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but want to have their ears tickled 
They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. My God, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. I mean, how much now of the messages that we hear is just ear-tickling messages? How much of it is just to make us feel good? How much of it of, of, of sermons and songs are about like making us feel good? And just less about, about worship, less about sin, less about dying to flesh, but just more about making us feel good. More about like the purpose that we have in our lives. And that's it. Everything's purpose-driven, purpose-driven, purpose-driven. And I'm not saying that that's a bad. I'm saying we need to throw all that out. There's a message in the purpose-driven mess. There's, there's, there's good, good message in that about God's purpose and our plan for a life. There's a biblical message, but when it comes to all of that, it's ear-tickling. When it's all of that, and it's not about how we're living our lives, and it's not about dying to flesh, and it's not about, you know, sin in our lives and, and repenting from sin in our lives, then it's, it's just ear-tickling. It's ear-tickling. And believe me, that's out there now. It's all throughout the megachurch market. It's all throughout. You know, ear-tickling messages. So be careful of that. And what else do I have? This is the last one. So humanism. So in Colossians, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to the Messiah. You know, the world, they do things the way they do it. But it's, it's not. We're not part of that. We're in it, but we're not of it. We're part of a kingdom, and the laws of the kingdom and the, and the reality of the kingdom are different from what out there, what's out there. And it may seem very true, and it may seem very academic, and it may seem very intellectual, but if it's, if it's not of the kingdom, if it's not of the word of God, then it's, 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 it's their stuff. It's not our stuff. We are members, we are citizens of a kingdom. And when that permeates into us, and this is things that Paul had to deal with, right? We had Greek philosophy and Hellenism that came in that was trying to penetrate into, into the early believers. We see that historically. And, this, and it's the same thing today. So the way the world works is the way the world works. <laughs> it's not kingdom. It's not kingdom. So I bring these forward to say that we are in the end times. And there are many deceptions that we are warned about in the Bible. And these deceptions are around today. And we need to be mindful of what we're watching, what we're letting in. And... Um, Make sure that the things that we're seeing, even if it seems spiritual, does it align with the word of God or does it not? You know, there's many people out there that might have a very, you know, if I told you that I, I successfully cast out a demon when I wore a blue hat, right? And then I say, you know what? I think we really need to wear blue hats when we cast out demons. You know, I can write a book on it. Doesn't mean it's true. I acknowledge your experience, but don't turn it into a doctrine, Okay unless the doctrine is in line with the word of God. Got it? So what do we do? There's only one thing, one thing we can do in this time. There's only one thing we could do in this hour when we see wars and we see rumors of wars and we see earthquakes and we see eclipses and we see all these things. There's only one thing we can do. And if anybody wants to join me, it's right down here. If anybody wants to join me, Father, we just repent as members of the body, Lord God. We just repent before you right now. Lord, there are many deceptions in this world, Father, and we just stand in the gap for the body of Messiah, for the body of Christ. We stand in the gap, Lord God, and we say forgive us. Forgive us for the time, Lord God, that we paid attention to myths. Forgive your body, Lord God, for the times that we paid attention to things that are misaligned with the word of God. Forgive us, Lord God, for the times that we've, 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 got our ears tickled by things that feel good and, and, and look good and seem so hyper-spiritual, but ultimately they're, we don't know what we're talking about. Like the one, when, we, when Paul spoke to Timothy, they think they know what they're talking about, but they don't know what they're talking about. Forgive us for the times that we've done that. And forgive us for the times when your body, your, your body, your, your beautiful body that you've set forth in this world to change this world has been compromised, have been compromised from the uncleanliness of the world that we've let it come in. Father, we ask for your forgiveness, Lord God. We know the judgment begins in the house of God. Father, we just come before you today, Lord God, in a spirit of repentance to forgive us. Forgive our sins, Lord God, and may you forgive the sins of our land as we come before you, Lord God, in this posture of forgiveness and repentance, asking for forgiveness.